let's describe precisely the procedure that we used to find a solution to a non-autonomous linear ordinary differential equation. So let's use what we had before and more generally if we have any vector field on RM that depends on some additional parameter such as time we have an ODE that's described by x dot at t equals v t comma x of t. A special situation occurs when the vector field is independent of time and when not only is this function an arbitrary continuous function, it's actually a linear function so that this is a matrix. If v is continuous then we can equivalently describe this ordinary differential equation with an integral equation of the form that we've described earlier. And you can check by the assumptions that we have, if I take the derivative of this, then um, I'm, I'm going to get exactly this equation back with the initial condition xa. So we described this earlier when v is a family of linear transformations and they act on these vectors here. More generally, we can use this idea to define a function on the metric space of continuous functions on the domain AB into RM and I think of these as my possible set of solutions. I'm going to think of this as the set of all functions from AB to RM, one of which is going to be a solution to this ordinary differential equation. So I can define a function that depends on this vector field V from this space to itself. What is that function? It takes an arbitrary function from AB so it's going to hit input is a function x on AB to RM. And I'm going to call it x because we're going to think of as x depending on time. So this parameter here is t. So it's, it's a little meta. I have to think of this as acting on functions. It's a function that takes in a function and gives me another function back. What is this function? Well, because this is also going to be a function, I have to tell you what it does for every t in the domain. So first, let me write it as phi v of x. And that's supposed to be a function on ab to rm. And what is this function? This function takes any t and it sends it to, and I'm leaving a lot of space here because it's going to send it to this, xa plus the integral of this vector field v at s comma x of s ds. And you can check this is a function of t and if x was initially continuous then this function is also continuous. So we might often write this output as phi v x comma t because it depends on these two parameters. Now that we've defined this function, a solution to our ordinary differential equation is exactly a fixed point of this function. If we find a fixed point, then that's saying that x of t this is our initial function, equals xa plus the integral of v um, integrated from a to t, which is exactly this integral equation, which we already know is equivalent to this ordinary differential equation. That's why defining this function is so important. 
and how it's related to our ordinary differential equation to begin with. Notice now, what happens if I take a function as its input, act on it by this, I'll get a new function, and keep doing this over and over again. We already did something like this for the case of a vector field, a time-dependent vector field, but of linear transformations, not just arbitrary vector fields. But it, it helps to actually write this out explicitly. What happens if I take a function with this, if I take an arbitrary function x, and I apply this twice? What I get is xa plus the integral from 0 to, and that's why I should include this coordinate t here, let me say x comma t. So it's the integral from a to t of this function, and this is supposed to be v of s comma x of s, but that's what we initially plugged in here, so that's going to be x of a plus the integral from a to s this time, v, let's say r, xr, dr, let's close these parentheses, then ds. So this is what happens when we iterate that function twice. And if we had a fixed point, then it's also going to be a fixed point of this. So we notice that um, what we described earlier with the linear transformation was if we kept on performing this procedure. And if this is a contraction, then we know that that procedure converges to a unique fixed point. Therefore, what we want to do is we want to show that this operation of performing this procedure is eventually a contraction. But we should ask ourselves, what conditions on V do we need to guarantee that this is eventually a contraction? So let me write that out. What conditions on V do we need to guarantee that C, V, raised to some power is a contraction for some n. And it turns out we know an answer to this. And it motivates the following definition. V, as above, is said to be fiber-wise globally Lipschitz. I believe there's a C somewhere in here. Uh, is fiber-wise globally Lipschitz, if and only if, there exists some number L greater than or equal to zero, such that V of T comma X minus V T, also that same T, but this time comma Y at two different points is less than or equal to L times the distance between x and y for all x and y in the domain, which is, let's say, r m, and for all t on the interval a to b. So the reason I'm not calling this function Lipschitz is because we have the same t here appearing in this expression. If I said t comma s, two different points in time, then I would use the distance on this space as a metric space using the standard distance. But instead, I'm just saying for any fixed t, the function is Lipschitz, but that's not enough either. I ask for a stronger condition because if I said that this is true for each t, then I would have a coefficient here that depends on t, this l, but I actually demand that that coefficient is the same for all t. 
So it's not exactly Lipschitz. It's not exactly Lipschitz for each t. It's sort of a combination of both of those conditions. And it's this condition here on a vector field v that will guarantee the existence of a solution to a differential equation and will also guarantee uniqueness.